Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. As we approach the holiday season, we realize there's going to be a lot of visitations with friends, family, and relatives. Those big dinners and all that consumption that we're going to have, everything we love about the holidays. And certainly one of the cornerstones of that holiday diet is that when we go and dive into things like sweets, the candied yams, the chocolate sitting out there on the tabletop, you name it, there's a whole array of things that our fingers will reach out for, put into our mouths so we can enjoy that sweetness that is the holidays as we know it. But for many of us, it even goes beyond that to a point where we might even find ourselves celebrating the holidays even day after day after that when it comes to sugar. In fact, sugar, as a nation, we're the second in the world when it comes to the consumption of sugar, just behind England. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is a guest who is a recovering sugar addict turned health coach and master yogi. Her message is going to be about being able to kick your sugar addiction within 7 to 10 days. We'll address the negative impact of eating too much sugar on the body, especially for those in midlife, and how to safely detox while balancing your hormones and lose weight with whole foods. I'd like to welcome the Beyond 50 radio program today, a certified health and wellness coach, live and raw food educator, and physical fitness and one-on-one group trainer, our special guest, Roseanne Baruki Zaft. Roseanne, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Thank you so much for having me today. It's really my pleasure and honor to help everybody to uh, just to live a happier and healthier life, especially at this time of the year. That is really challenging. I'm glad to be here. Well, it always is, isn't it, when it comes to the holidays, because it's one of those times that we can take an addiction, have what we call a nice, juicy rationalization for why we take that action, <laughs> when we know we really should pull back. And you certainly have had your ups and downs over the years, with this particular addiction. Now, tell us how this all started for you. Well, it goes back actually many, many decades for me. Um, I'm actually a woman in long-term recovery, so what that means for me that I haven't had the need for a drink or a drug for the past 13 years. And for that, I'm so grateful. But the truth is, once I put down the stuff that was really killing me, I found out that... um, I had what was more than just a sweet chew. I actually had developed, um, besides a a host of other uh, health issues, uh, candida, which is a a bacteria fungus in our digestive tract that goes bad. We have good bacteria and bad. Mine, the candida, was bad. And um, I went to a naturopathic doctor here in Scottsdale, and she explained to me what was going on because I couldn't understand why. After a wonderful, healthy meal, I needed more sugar. I just needed something sweet. So um, it took a couple of years, actually, to really get down to it, to realize that I not only was addicted to sugar uh, from um, an emotional and behavioral level, but my body needed sugar. This this bad bacteria needed it to survive. And uh, from that point on, it was just kind of like a mission to explain to people that, hey, it's not your fault. Um, There are some things going on that make us powerless over the sweet stuff. And there's some good sweet stuff because we need it and some other stuff that's virtually killing us. So now how long had sugar been an addiction for you? Well, you know, when you think about the alcohol uh, consumption, which is really nothing more than sugar, um, I had been clean for about a year when I found out that I was still craving it. But I can remember as a little kid loving, I mean, this is before the alcohol and drugs, just loving those slow pokes and Hershey kick kisses and Tootsie Roll, just love this stuff. So I always had the sweet tea because it was just something that just, um, as, as I've learned through my studies, Sugar does some really wonderful things for our brain. It makes us feel really good. And um, after getting clean and thinking that, okay, I've put down things that I was doing to make me feel good, eating healthy, um, it was about a year of just really struggling with why do I need more sugar. So I'd say that the 
the, the realization of the sugar addiction was about a year. So it took you a year to be able to do that. Uh, it took me a year to realize I had it, and it okay. took me about about uh, about two years of, of whittling away at different things. You know, I had other health issues. I had adrenal problems. I had uh, food allergies. I had a lot of stuff going on. And after the first year of dealing with some of the other health issues, uh, we really zoned in on on the candida and uh, that process of eliminating the candida, actually getting rid curing, if you will, the candida, um, took a good three months, a real solid three months of of a rigorously honest program of total uh, absence of any sugar and carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. Now, here's something I'm curious about. Now, Mm -hmm. you had mentioned, you know, as a child that you liked the particular candies that you had mentioned, as we all did. In fact, Mm -hmm. Jerry Seinfeld, during one of his comedy routines, talks about how Halloween rolls along and all of a sudden we become sugar-addicted morons. (laughs) Our hands go out, we just started going to a hypnosis, and of course we put on the costume and we're out there beating on doors saying, Happy Halloween, putting the bag out there, you know, and sometimes we're throwing the stuff out like the apple that the well-intentioned trick-or-treat E or er, whatever you want to call them, throws into our bag. But the fact is, is it's really amazing. I remember this myself with my own children as they first discovered candy. They couldn't get enough of it, and it's really amazing how quickly we get hooked. In your experience, why do you think that is? What is the brain chemistry that happens there that causes this? Well, it is. It is all about brain chemistry. I'm going to try to explain it like this, and I don't like to get too science nerdy because I don't want to lose anybody about on this subject, but this is really what happens. You eat sugar, which really is hidden in a lot of things besides trick-or-treat candy, and that's obvious, but things like cereal, bagels, breakfast bars, pasta, we, so we eat sweets, eat sugar, and then our pancreas secretes insulin in response to the amount of sugar consumed, and we get an insulin spike. So there's a biological process happening. Then the liver turns the sugar to energy and stores it uh, as glycogen, which is a fuel source, or turns into fat. So if the liver um, is releasing sugar in the bloodstream, blood pressure is rising, glucose levels increase, and we get this blood sugar spike. What happens here, high insulin levels cause blood sugar levels to plummet. Your body gets tired, thinks it needs more sugar to offset the imbalance, and you get a signal in your brain that you're hungry again. You need more. So subsequently, what's happening, we're, we're getting this experience of a dopamine depletion. And the dopamine is that brain chemical that makes us feel good. And we get an immediate sugar withdrawal. So this addiction really occurs when we're getting this release. It's like eat sugar, crave sugar. Eat sugar, crave sugar. It's kind of an endless loop because we're just trying to uh, kind of pacify those dopamine receptors. So uh, as I, I say to my clients all the time, you know, it's not your willpower. When it comes to hormones, willpower loses every time because our blood sugar is so unstable and our home, hormone levels are, are like a roller coaster. Does that make sense? It certainly does. It's interesting that you say that it actually causes a real roller coaster ride with our hormones, and especially for those of us that are approaching midlife, that's certainly something we want to address, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we find, uh, at least I hear this with my clients all the time, who, who, who are eating, like, and I'm putting my quote fingers, my air quotes in here, who are eating right, eating healthy, not realizing that how much sugar they're consuming, that um, there's all these hormone shifts, this fatigue, these energy level shifts, the brain fog, and it's really a, an imbalance of hormones that, over years, it's like our body can only take so much, and then there's an overload, and our liver can only do so much, and then there's an overload, and all this toxicity is just building up in our body, and then, like we just can't we can't empty the trash fast enough. <laughs> we can't get the junk out of the trunk fast enough. Right. And you know, when you get the ripple age of fifty plus, um, you know, we don't have that that 
metabolism like we had when we were earlier because we've just been kind of a unconsciously, consciously, unconsciously um, just, uh, stuffing it with the wrong, feeding the wrong foods to our body. Now, what's really interesting to me is, uh, you know, again, talking about children, it's really fascinating how often, and having worked in the food services industry, parents reward their children with sugar. And I had a hippie friend of mine many years ago say, you know, it's fascinating because what they're actually doing, and it was really (laughs) kind of, and he was kind of this way anyway, but he says the harsh reality is what you're beginning to create are future heroin addicts. And it's been also said that sugar has the same addictive levels that cocaine does, too. Is that true? Well, the research now is telling that sugar is eight times more addictive than cocaine. Eight There's times lots, more addictive, wow. Eight times And more it's addictive. legal. <laughs> and it's legal. It's legal and lethal. And, and I mean, as a former, and, you know, it, and I do share this, I mean, I, you know, I did cocaine for years, and I didn't think... I, I didn't think I was addicted to it. I just did it to drink more. Right. (laughs) 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 Kind of stay awake. I need another beer. Get it over here, would you? (laughs) It's like, like, give me a cup of coffee so I can do, you know, I can stay awake and to eat more sugar. And and it's just kind of funny, but it's the same thing. But, yeah, uh, the the addiction process. And and you talked about we're, we're teaching our kids to be heroin addicts. It's really sad because when you look at, um, uh, the Center for Disease Control, we've got, Twelve and a half million kids are considered medically obese right now, and 16% of our kids are overweight. We've got um, kids now, we're seeing over the past 10 years, that children um, are become, being diagnosed with uh, onset diabetes. I mean, this is, besides the addiction, we're, we're, we're making our kids sick at a real early age. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting you point that out, uh, Roseanne, because of the fact that I remember being at a water park many years ago, and I had mm-hmm. my children out there. I was with my mom. Mm-hmm. And I noticed that. I said, Mom, take a look at this. She says, what? And I said, look at all these kids. They're overweight. Yeah. You know, and it was just really alarming to see something like that. So you're absolutely right that we're seeing that more. It's like an epidemic, isn't it? Well, it is, because it, in the past, you know, we were uh, – what we find now that the we're going from eating uh, it, historically Americans were eating about 20 teaspoons of sugar per year. Okay, now we're consuming 142 pounds of sugar a year. I mean, we're living longer, right? But we're not really mm-hmm. living any healthier because of it. And and um, a takeaway I'd love everyone to just be aware of is one simple fact: if you look at any label. Four grams of sugar equals one teaspoon. So when you look at that, when you start looking at what you're eating, that by uh, it's recommended that we're not eating more than uh, six teaspoons of sugar a day. Well, you're going to do that at breakfast. You know, all bets are off. You've already done that with your bagel or in your and your jelly, right? So um, and what we start. With a breakfast, that is, we think, healthy, that whole grain bagel or what, what not. And it's just a constant day, it, day spike in ro- the roller coaster ride. Crave it, eat it, crave it, eat it. So we start out just consuming that, that sugar in the morning, and it, we need it the rest of the day. That's, it's just really amazing. Now, when it came to you... <laughs> turning your addiction around so that you can mm-hmm. regain your health. Tell mm-hmm. us about the thinking process behind what it was like, because sometimes that's the biggest, well, most of the time that's the biggest battle is you have an emotional component to the addiction, and then you have an action series of thoughts that lead you to actually falling backwards, if you will. What was that like for you? That's a great question, Daniel, because I still deal with that today. It really is a, 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 like thinking out the, the, uh, the addiction because it, it's always kind of looming back there. So when I first realized that I had to eliminate sugar completely in order to heal my gut, um, 
my doctor just said, okay, pick a day and we're going to start this program. Well, I will never recommend that for anyone <laughs> because it was like getting off heroin. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was so sick and so tired that I had to do something and I was willing to do anything. So it took a lot of willingness. So I was willing to do anything. And if that meant cutting out sugar, knowing that I still could eat but not sugar, I did. Well, the first three days of complete elimination, for me, a total sugar addict at that point, um, we're, pure, we're pure hell, I have to say. I, as I mentioned, I wouldn't recommend that for anybody to do that. I mean, I eliminated, I'm not even talking about sugar, I, I eliminated fruits, um, any carbohydrates, I completely eliminated. Um, so uh, after the third day, Actually, my cravings were getting less and less. I could almost say gone. Then there was more of the mental component. Uh, when I would get a little stressed out or a little tired, I felt like, oh, if I could just have this or that just to pick me up. But I learned, and I've, I've learned over time, that there were other foods that could supply what my brain needed for that fatigue. You know, the, the, the good carbohydrates, those complex carbs that do create, contain, if you will, sugar, but they're carbohydrates that my brain needs, not sugar. So today, you know, fast forward now, and this, is, this was uh, 13 years ago, uh, or 12 years ago when I really hit this hard. Um, today, I find myself when I'm really tired, uh, I'm really stressed, I'll want to reach for something sweet. And I'm not going to lie to you, there's times when I'll just run into a, a, a drugstore and go, okay, give me a turtle, you know, a package of something, a kind bar, or something like that. I don't know if I'm allowed to say brand on the, on the air, but uh, give me something sweet because I need that fix. But I find more times than not that I'll say to myself, okay, what's behind this? Why am I reaching for this? Oh, I'm tired. Okay, take a nap. Oh, I'm stressed. Okay, breathe. Oh, I'm worried about something. Okay, relax. Do you find another tool? So I, I had this little toolbox or tool belt, if you will, of other things to choose before I pick up. And I, that's really pretty much any addict story of um, being in a 12-step program that we have tools that we've been that I've been taught to use, so I don't pick up a drink or a drug. And again. As we just said, sugar is no different. It's just a legal, lethal drug. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing, too, about sugar, and, and I know we'll, we'll talk about this here in a second, is the fact that it permeates through a large majority of our processed foods. And, in fact, there was a time when I was in a fast food restaurant, which I rarely go to those anymore. And like you were saying, it's interesting what that thought process is when it mm -hmm. comes to you making that choice to reach out for something that you have come to terms to say, I don't want this anymore. I want to make this change in my life. And here's the, an interesting thing that I brought up uh, on a segment here and there over the years is this, that you see all these fast food restaurants. It's really fascinating in most cities how many restaurants there are in the first place. <laughs> I mean, just all the oh, food yeah. we have here in this country is just crazy. <laughs> But the truth is, when you're out there driving, driving takes a lot of focus. It takes, you know, the concentration. Uh, yeah, there's a lot that goes on, so it can create an anxiety. And I would hazard a guess that at least eight out of ten people who decide to go through the drive-through aren't really hungry, but are actually finding ways to relieve that anxiety, you know, mm -hmm. so that they feel better. Did you feel like that was ever like that for you as well? That's so interesting. As you were talking about the driving experience, uh, last year I drove back from, uh, from Scottsdale to Cleveland. I did a, a cross-country to get home for the summer. And um, if I did stop for gas or a bathroom break, I would run into the store, get a bottle of water or whatnot, and I would just look at all the junk food and the fast food. You know, there's, there's fast food places at all the, the stops on the freeway, and the people just just – getting the burgers, the chips, the things you know, that, that are still hidden with sugar. And um, I realize it's unconscious eating for, yes, 
to answer your question, yes, unconscious eating to just keep one awake, something to do to relieve the monotony. Um, but oddly enough, um, or ironically enough, one of my tools, I, I carry a, a little, little vials of essential oils. So as I was getting tired, I knew uh, I couldn't do any more coffee. I didn't want to eat more, you know, any candy, something to keep me going. I was in, just taking inhalations of a peppermint oil. And it was stimulated to my brain. It made me more alert, more awake. Um, it gave me a whole different chemistry response in my brain that I felt less stress. And uh, it relieved that. So simple affordable, safe, and it's easy on the waistline, too. <laughs> ah, <laughs> easy on the brain as well. I mean, how many yeah. of us actually oh. have, you know, a high concentration of sugar in our diets and how we tend to behave as a result? Well, you talked about that sugar and, and, and the hidden facts. I was reading online yesterday. I was just curious about it because we as baby boomers. You know, it's our generation – in the early 60s, that fast food chains even started to pop up. I mean, I don't know about you, but I remember McDonald's was a treat. Like, right. it was a good report card. It was a birthday. It was something that, like, wow, we're going to McDonald's. And see, so to, my friend was right. You got rewarded with sugar, and then you became a heroin addict. No, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> exactly. exactly. No, really. Give me another milkshake. Um, yeah, and, and now... Um, the fact that it's a staple, like, oh, don't worry, we're not, mom's not cooking, we're going to McDonald's, you know, getting one of those happy, happy meals, of course it makes me happy, there's a ton of sugar in it, and um, we'll probably talk a little bit later, but, you know, that's when I started doing the research on reading labels, because I had to, because I needed to know what was in my food, there were all these names of sugar, I didn't realize they were sugar. There were all these words, all these big words, words I couldn't pronounce. I still can't pronounce many of them. Then I'm like, what is this? What is this? What is this? Just another name for sugar. So when, again, my clients tell me, oh, well, I'm eating right. I'm eating healthy. I'm like, do you really know what you're eating? Do you really know how many grams of sugar you really are ingesting in your, quote, unquote, healthy menu, your healthy diet? So uh, when I did the research uh, last year, when I wrote my book to find out, there's over, for sure, over 57, if not almost 100 different names of sugar that we have in our foods. So we are so confused and misled about how much sugar we're really ingesting. Mm -hmm. I know, uh, you know, as you talked about McDonald's, one of the reasons I got to the point that I just didn't like their food, which, you know, it's pretty easy not to, I guess, <laughs> mm -hmm. was the yeah, fact the of flavor. how <laughs> much sugar is in the buns for their sandwiches. You, you just it taste, it drips off of that stuff. and So, I don't know. You know, they, I, they, I read recently that they actually even put sugar in the french fries. There's, oh, boy. Uh, and so, you, you know that flavor. <laughs> yeah, so there's something. So they there's, throw the salt so you get sort of a sweet and salty taste going sweet and salty, on. Salty, yep. <laughs> and those fries, I, it's been years literally since I've had them, but it's like you just couldn't eat one, right? You couldn't eat just one. There was like, I just have to have another one. Yep. You're right. The buns, um, bread. Uh, yeah, that's so right. Like it's, it's, the best thing you can do is really eliminate whites. If it's white, eliminate it. Whether it's pasta, I mean, I. We're talking like whole grain. Well, look and see what that really means. Um, whole grain pastas, whole grain bread. I would just really venture to say there's still a lot of sugar in this. What we think is is healthy, and 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 for us folks over fifty, especially we find women that are menopausal, postmenopausal, it's it's really tough to break down car carbohydrates. Simple ones for sure, and even the complex can be. You know, a lot of grades. It's kind of hard for us to break it out. We just are. We don't have that ability like we did when we were younger. Mm -hmm. Now, tell us, for instance, uh, what type of health issues uh, that can be eased by eliminating sugar. Well, I can give you a list that's about a page long, but I'll keep it as simple as possible here. Um, 
the first one, which I think is the biggest issue uh, that we're facing uh, in America, is diabetes. Uh, huge we're, we're, obesity, diabetes, diabetes, uh, heart disease, cholesterol, things as simple as headaches and migraines, depression, insomnia, uh, even the aging of our skin. I mean, simply by starting to eliminate sugar, we can make huge changes um, with our immune system because sugar suppresses our immune system. So that means it reduces the production of antibiotics. And we tend to not be able to bounce back as quickly from a cold or a flu. Um, but instead, we'll suck on cough drops or cough syrup. If you look at it, there's sugar in it. So it's kind of an oxymoron that we're taking something that actually is causing us to still have a suppressed immune system. Um, where else can I? What else can I tell you about? Um, when we eat too much, when we eat sugar, it increases the um, acid balance in our body. It decreases our thyroid function, um, our metabolism. I mean, you can see that it, we pretty much are affected all around by that sweet white stuff. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. As as I mentioned, you know, these diseases don't happen overnight. This is from from years of of adding sugar in. And uh, (laughs) I've I've talked to, I've coached some of my clients about eliminating stuff. They're like, well, I can't eliminate my wine. I'm like, I'm not telling you to eliminate it, but how many glasses of wine are you drinking? I mean, when you look at just the sugar content and that, can you can you cut it? Can you make it a wine spritzer? Can you do something just so that if you want to have a couple glasses, great. But do you realize you're just you're drinking teaspoons of sugar? Mm-hmm. What do you think, from your experience, is the reason, let's say, our society has such a high level of addiction? Oh, let's see. Why our society has a high level of addiction. I mean, certainly well, helping and working with as many people as you have sure. over the years, you might have come to some conclusions that you would see as consistencies for the answer to that question. Well, I'm going to have to blame a lot on our food industry. Okay. I I was talking to one of my clients today who's 82, and he he is um, actually quit drinking a couple of years ago on his own, which was, was fabulous, and now consumes a boatload of sugar. And I have to laugh because he doesn't see it as a problem. But again, at 82, he's, he's really in great shape. And we were talking about how back in his day, as a boy growing up, the beef was cleaner, you know, food was cleaner. The chemicals weren't in there that are now. There wasn't fast food in his, his day. But for... You and I, growing up again in the 60s where there's fast food and processed food, TV dinners came out when I was a little kid. I mean, how to preserve food, so all these preservatives. So so I'm going to, to answer your question outright, I'm going to blame it on the food industry that they have been uh, manufacturing, I, I hate to even call it food, <laughs> they've been act, manufacturing things for us to eat that... Um, have really caused us to be addicted to sugar. I, mean, I don't know if you knew this, but there, many of the major food corporations have have labs where their scientists just uh, work on the right chemistry to create that bliss point that makes you want more of the food. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, needless to say, uh, we're a society of fast-paced people to begin with, but uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point my finger at the food industry. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I asked this question, actually, it was many years ago, about why do you believe, or what is it that caused us to get to a level where one out of three people get onset diabetes? And the first time I had that question answered, they specifically said it was because of the invention 
and the introduction of corn syrup. They had to find a way to do something with these mountains of oh, corn yeah. that were growing in Iowa. And I mean, we're talking mountains. Oh, and it yeah, was I've fascinating seen because, on that. Yeah, there was a uh, documentary that I watched called King Corn that mm-hmm. addresses mm-hmm. that very thing. And it was really mm-hmm. interesting to find out how many products corn syrup is used in. And this is a genetic, scientific modification from corn. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And and totally that corn syrup that triggers that creates that trigger point that creates the addiction. And um what you had just said about the fact of the the processing of it. If you if you recall, I don't know about you, but I love to cook. I mean I really like to create food because I like to know what's in my food. And I'm gonna readdress what we talked about the fast food and going out to restaurants. Um there's some fabulous restaurants here in Scottsdale and in many places around the world and the country but that are that tote health and wellness, but we still don't know what's going on in the food. Um, but if you start creating, if we start making food again, come home, like I'm calling it cocooning, stay home, create more food that you know what you're putting in your meals, um, it's going to really help with that addiction because you're not going to be putting in those extra little uh, additives that restaurants put in. I mean, they have to produce, even the finest restaurants will will have to produce food quick uh, that's pre-made, pre-packaged, processed, that has things like corn syrup and other, other chemistry, if you will, that's creating us to be more addictive, hence more obese, hence more sick. Now, uh, as I understand that you began this journey of turning this addiction around by the age of 44, is that correct? Mm Mm-hmm. And now, just to give you folks an idea, we're looking at about 12 years later, you ended up winning first place (laughs) in a particular competition for women. Tell us about that. I did, yes. Well, actually, um, when I was was going to be turning 55, I decided... I wanted to be in the best shape of my life. I was feeling really good. I'd done a lot of work. Uh, so I entered a figure competition for women over 50. And um, it was my first time, and it was, I was very nervous. And uh, I did pretty well. I placed second, but that wasn't good enough for me. So the next year at 56, I went back, and I actually won first place in a 50 and over women's figure competition in Cleveland. Uh, it was an all-natural uh, figure competition. So that was pretty exciting stuff to, to know that I accomplished that. And it was all-natural, meaning no drugs. You couldn't be, it was drug-tested. And it was based on just you know, eating, eating right. I didn't do crazy dieting. I worked with a naturopath to make sure I was eating enough protein, vegetables, and, um, and working out. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it was kind of fun. <laughs> well, I wanted to bring that up, Roseanne, because it's really fascinating when it comes to midlife and the midlife mindset. Right. Somehow we have gotten to a point that we feel these possibilities are behind us now. You know, if we didn't do it by the time we were in our 20s, 30s, maybe our 40s, but that's even a gray area in and of itself. Well, I just pretty much have to settle for the way things are. And then you've obviously said, well, no, I've decided that's not how it's going to be, and you made that change. That takes commitment. And what I find fascinating is this. It is tremendously, and I'm, and I'm sure you, you know this from experience as well as your clients, the body is so amazingly resilient that if you're willing to do and to think in a direction that you want to take to make it better, it's going to respond in ways that will astonish you. And I say this because we had a guest on our program earlier this year, a guy by the name of Rich Roll. Is that a name that comes to mind? Oh, no, I don't. I'm okay, that's okay no. because I'm sure a lot of people out there don't know this, but okay. a lot like you, you know, he was somewhat athletic. He was in college. He was a swimmer, but eventually he got mm-hmm. out of that and, kind of went about day-to-day routine living, and he became a drinker himself. Mm -hmm. And he says that by the time he was 44 years old, interestingly enough, about the same age as you, he found himself going up his own flight of stairs in his home, and he thought he was going to go into cardiac arrest. 
He really thought it was the beginning <laughs> right. of the end for himself. Right, right. When he realized that wasn't going to happen, he says, you know what? I've had enough of this lifestyle here. And he turned it around. Now, here is a guy that has the record for doing five Ironman marathons Holy in five crap. <laughs> days on the island of Hawaii. In oh, five my. days, five Ironman triathlons. <laughs> and I thought amazing. to myself, and it was doing exactly what you did. He went to Whole Natural mm-hmm. Foods, and he talks about all this in his book. And we talked a lot about mindset. But it was to show the possibility, and, and this took him, I think it was anywhere from five to eight years. So it took some time. But think mm-hmm. about the kind mm-hmm. of shape you have to be in just to even be in something like that, let Absolutely. alone completing five and five and a half days, five of them. Yeah. You know, and that you can actually get out of bed the next day. You know, But the fact <laughs> is, that's what I mean by resilience. And hasn't it astounded you, that experience for yourself? No, that is that is so true. And and. What you just said to me or to the audience is something I try, and and the competition really too. There was a under there was an underlying reason to prove to women it is never too late. It's never too late. Um, it does take. Uh, there's three steps in it. it. Takes awareness, willingness, and action. That's what I look at when I when I coach my clients. You're aware that there's a problem and there's a solution. You're willing to do what you need to do for the for the end result that you want to achieve, and you take that action to do it. And you're right. The body always wants to repair itself. But we, our mind, our thinking gets in the way. The body is an amazing biocomputer, and, and food programs it. I believe that food... Is uh, as Hippocrates um, says, "Let thy food be thy medicine; thy medicine be thy food." And another, um, another famous phrase is, uh, "Either your food is one man's poison, is one man's is one man's fuel." So, you know, you look at the fact that I could eat something that might be really good for me that may not work for you, but there's such a plethora of good, healthy, natural foods out there that work for our body and we just need to be willing or want to be willing to, to do, to, to research it, to do, to make the, the effort to do it. Um, what I also mentioned earlier is the fact that spending more time at home cooking and preparing is a big plus in order to, to achieve these goals. Think about it this way. Um, if you were to go out to dinner, by the time, first of all, you get ready, you drive to the restaurant, you get to the restaurant, you wait to be seated, you wait to be waited on, you wait for your food, you eat, you drive home. How many hours does that take? Three, Quite a bit. maybe? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know how much food you can make, prepare at home for your, for your week? Good healthy snacks and things that, that really feed and fuel your body to feel better. I mean, the surges of energy you get by eating in a way that's natural and easy to prepare. Um, to, to get rid of brain fog and feel balanced by eating these natural foods. You know, to, to lose weight with, without having to diet. And I don't like to think about any programs that I coach with my clients. They're not diets. They're just lifestyle changes, learning how to reset the metabolism, how to stabilize your blood sugar. You know how not having to beat yourself up with a bunch of exercise. Ironically, uh, when I was training for my competition for the second year, um, I was working with a with a, another health tra- coach, a uh, fitness coach, and I just was so burned out of doing cardio because I taught so many spin classes six months before that. All I did was walk every day. I walked, you know, a good steady, solid pace, thirty to four minutes a day, thirty to forty minutes a day. I didn't beat myself up. I didn't beat my joints up. I just ate right and moved. And the, my my weight kept coming off for this competition because you had to be pretty lean on, in it. It's it's really easy. It really is easy. And, and I think that's true, too, is you've got to find a way or get to a place where you achieve enjoying things like that. 
it -hmm. astonishes me that people don't cook more. You know, they claim they're just too busy. Well, the first (laughs) thing you should do is sit and take a look at this mindset of your belief. Is it true you're too busy? Right. You know, what evidence do you have (laughs) that you're too busy? Nobody's ever too busy. You know, you can always find time. But I always tell people because there were times when I would come home just kind of feeling tired, like I didn't really want to cook. And 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 then I would decide just to go ahead and do it, and I'd start simply. And the truth of the matter is, cooking is something everybody should be doing. It should be required. Everybody should cook. And, and these are the benefits that I gain from it. The first thing is you engage in a very creative process. Okay. Mm-hmm. The second thing, too, is when you're involved in the thoughts and the actions of cooking, you really kind of slip into sort of a meditation. It's sort of like a Zen tea ceremony, if you will. Absolutely. And then by the end of it, you've prepared your favorite food better than anybody in the world. <laughs> exactly. And then if you get to share your meal with someone else, the pleasure of sharing a meal with someone, right? With your, your love in it, your energy in it, and then you're sharing that energy with someone else. It's, it is. It's, that is so rewarding. There's, there's true pleasure in that. There's a different kind of high, if you will, pleasure of uh, uh, experiencing that with, with whether it is yourself or someone else. It's I, I'm right there with you. That I think is why I love to cook so much. It's just, it just has so many benefits. Besides, it tastes good, and I know what's in it. <laughs> well, there you go. You know exactly what's in it because when you went and picked the ingredients off the shelves, you didn't have to read labels, did you? <laughs> no. Yeah, an <laughs> apple is an apple. <laughs> Uh, vegetable is a vegetable. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Not you know, that complicated. Now, speaking of diet, now I know when it came to you deciding to end your addiction, you know, as you were talking mm-hmm. about the 80-year-old, 80-plus-year-old who was drinking most of his life, he quits, mm-hmm. and then he goes to a lot of sugar. And, and you see oh, that yeah. they're eating candy bars or they're guzzling down ice cream <laughs> or they hit the Gatorade. I've seen a whole slew of different things when people stop you can tell almost when they stop drinking because they start picking up habits they never had before. Well, mm-hmm. you know, and there, there it is. It could be soda pop, a whole slew of things. But now when it came to changing your diet, how mm-hmm. simple did you keep it so that you could at least stay the course long enough to create the habit? Because that's what we're really also doing too is we're changing our habit and then our mindset along with that so we can build the strength to continue in the direction that we want to go. Right. Well, I was advised by my naturopath of what foods that I could eat as much of as I wanted and what foods that I, for this particular case of candida I had to eliminate. And I'm not going to lie to you when I say, oh, my gosh, I can't eat berries. I can't eat Apples, I was kind of bummed, and she said, don't worry, this is temporary. We, we need to kill this, this fungus. But, so when I found out what I could make and all the foods that I really did like, um, that it, it takes for, um, and then the research shows this, it takes about 30 days to create a habit, 30 to 45 days, and about another 45 days to make that habit lifestyle. So what I ask my clients to do is, you know, give it at least, 90 days of, of committing to a lifestyle change. Now, here's the funny part, personally, my experience. As I was doing this and eating healthy and I was teaching classes and fitness coaching, private coaching people, and I was losing weight. And at, not, at that time, I didn't need to really, but it was because of, of, this, uh, of the, cutting the carbs back so much. So I go, are you, you know, do you have like, something going on, you're, you're, you really look thinner. And I'm like, listen, I, I am eating so much more food. I was eating three meals a day plus snacks. I was eating. I was not feeling deprived at all. And um, it was kind of a, odd to realize the more I ate, the better I felt, the better I looked. And this is so true with many of my clients. They don't eat enough. But... When they do eat, they're starving, that they'll just kind of shovel food in because they're past the point. They're starving. So they're trying to eat anything. Does that make sense? Have you? Yes, absolutely. That, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so to practice new habits, it's a little uncomfortable in the beginning, but it, everything's quite doable. 
mm-hmm. and and you you find a rhythm. And for me personally, what I like to do is my Saturday Saturday is a grocery day, and then Sunday I spend a couple hours in the kitchen. I prep all my snacks for the week. Um, there, I'll get my proteins, whether it's the chicken or hard boiled eggs or things like that. I'll get some of those ready. Um, I have everything I need for green smoothies. I'm a big green smoothie fan. And uh, it becomes my little ritual, my little meditative time of, of getting things together. So for the week, I'm ready. It's easy for me to come home and make dinner within 15 minutes. I'm in, I'm out. I've got it going on. I'm, I'm prepared. And that's the key, to be prepared. Well, it seems to me Rachel Ray's almost out of a job then, huh? <laughs> You've exactly. reduced her thirty minute Wait. meals down to oh half. My gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The only time I spend a lot of time on cooking something is when I'm starting to create less but Sunday I was in my kitchen trying a couple new recipes. So that's my creative time where I'm like, I'm gonna try this and that but for day to day living, no. It it doesn't need to be that complicated. So tell me, how valuable has the Vitamix machine been for you? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's a lifesaver. And if, if you can't afford a Vitamix, the Nutribullets now, the new bullets, the RXs are great. But um, I use my Vitamix daily. Um, I do personally do at least a quart of green smoothie a day. Um, you can also, I uh, through my experience and the recipes that are there, recipes I give on my uh, website, you can make amazing chocolate puddings. You can make amazing soups, uh, warm soups, because now that winter is approaching. So you know, we'd like things a little bit warmer for our constitution for most of us. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's And it's easy to clean up. I'm still a fan of juicing, but I, I much prefer smoothies because you're not losing all that fiber and all that right. good nutrition. Yeah, and super simple. Well, not only that, too, but you know how Americans can tend to be when they discover something is good for them. They think, well, <laughs> the more I do, the better it must be. And the fact is, you go out there and you juice up a bunch of fruit and you drink that, you can Ooh. get yourself in a lot of trouble, can't you? Yeah, the, 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 the beauty of juicing is that it does go directly into your system. It's kind of like an IV. Right. But, but if you're juicing greens, yes. But if you're juicing a whole bunch of carrots and apples and uh, any kind of soft fruits like that, you are getting a direct spike of high uh, of, of fructose, which is pretty tough on our liver as well. Mm-hmm. If you're not used to juicing, that that can be it can create quite a healing crisis too. Mm-hmm. And not because we were trying to do a commercial or an endorsement right. <laughs> for Vitamix, but the fact is. When I started doing smoothies, and there's so many creative smoothies you can make out there that are just delicious, you start feeling better. And and, and it's interesting because that's really most of the time how I start my day. I remember Uh there was a time when I went out to breakfast. And, you know, for me, and I still do it, but it's like maybe once a year now. You go out, you hit the country fried steak, the hash browns, the (laughs) eggs, you name it, right? (laughs) But I remember How do you feel when about I was, an hour later. <laughs> yeah, but I remember when I was doing that one time, and this was years ago, and when I was finished, I realized, you know, the only thing I want to do now is go home and take a nap. And that was where it changed for me. I said, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. This is not what breakfast should be doing to you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But now as a smoothie person, and I'm not mm-hmm. trying to become self-righteous like some health people can be, and you're certainly not one of them is that when you do this, you feel full, you feel light, and you start making better decisions and when you decide to eat, and you feel a lot more empowered. Was that the same experience for you? Oh, it totally was, and mm-hmm. and I hear it from my clients. Mm-hmm. I hear this. I mean, I'll get emails from people after I teach a smoothie class. I'll, my suggestion is, okay, for 30 days, one green smoothie a day. That's all I'm asking you to do. Do whatever else you want. Just incorporate a green smoothie. Mm-hmm. I'll get emails back saying, "You're not going to believe this, but my aches and pains are are being eliminated, or my skin looks better, or I just got a new reading in my cholesterol, or my blood uh, my blood work came back better." I mean, I hear those things, and it's so awesome to know that 
it's true. It works, and it's simple. And it's like, well, why aren't we all doing it? Mm-hmm. Um, and what you said about the the eating uh, traditional breakfast. I mean, that food coma. I have found that uh, when I do make those choices, and you know, I do, like I am in a coma, and I see all my clients who eat like that. They're kind of like they don't realize how good they feel because they're so used to being in this food coma of sorts. Mm-hmm. But yeah, let's. We, uh, the, uh, any, even if you don't have a Vitamix, I, I encourage people: wh- whatever blender you have, start there. Start with start something, with and I guarantee, when yep. you start feeling it, you're going to think, you know, maybe it's time to get the right tools to do the job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep, exactly. The first experience I had with a Vitamix, I'll share this kind of quickly. I was with friends, and this is when I was just going through school for my raw food chef uh, certification and with friends and I heard this noise in the kitchen and I didn't know what my friend was doing and she comes out she goes do you want some ice cream and I looked at her and I said you know I don't really eat dairy I I can't do it but thanks anyhow she's like no no you could eat this I'm sure just try it so you know dip my spoon into this smooth creamy concoction I'm like oh my gosh what is this and all she simply did was took a bag of frozen strawberries and a can of coconut milk and blend it together. She made this amazing strawberry ice cream. And I'm like, what is the machine? And that's when I got turned on to the Vitamix. And that ah. was, oh, I don't know, like All it took ago. was a scoop of ice cream, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right, I had eaten ice cream for years because of, of what I'd gone through. But uh-huh. I can eat ice cream again. So um, that's how simple it was to make ice cream. Mm. That two ingredients and a high-speed blender that could whip something up that quickly. Mm-hmm. That's excellent to hear. And the reason I wanted to bring that up for the for the listeners is start simply. And, and it's funny how people will start at the extreme end when they make choices and then wonder, well, why haven't I made that change that I thought I was? I mean, look at New Year's. <laughs> you know, we, mm-hmm. we, we all, how many people do you think are going to commit in the New Year to changing their <laughs> diet? <laughs> how many people well. are going to going to want to change by quitting their addictions? And how many of those people by the 30th day, are going to go back to doing what they did anyway. And usually it's even less than 30 days. Within 10 to 12 days, that addiction sneaks up. It just does. Mm-hmm. Um, if, you're not, if you're not coached or educated on how to do it right. Um, so it is so much better, as you mentioned, start, start slow, add something in, which crowds something out. Right. Like you said, make a smoothie, and you're not going to think twice about maybe having that bagel. You're not going to crave as much because you're getting what your body is getting what it need, needs, and it won't need the other stuff. It won't mm-hmm. crave the other stuff. Yeah, fascinating stuff. I know as I talked with the neurologist years ago, that was one of the things we talked about: is why is it so common for people to have difficulty changing habits? And he says. You know, we're all that way. You know, it isn't about willpower. It's actually because of how no. the brain works. Right. And here's what right. he told me, and it was in, in the book, and I thought this was fascinating because once <laughs> I heard this, I felt really super empowered. Now, this is for all the listeners out there, and this is what I was told. The brain, think about all the functions that the brain performs when it comes to the body that are automatic. You know, mm-hmm. we get up and walk. We think about walking, but after we start walking, it all becomes automatic driving, eating, the process of breaking down and digesting food, the blood flowing, breathing in and out. I mean, just think of everything the brain has to do to keep our body functioning the way it's supposed to. And then you have to realize that to do this, it takes a lot of energy for the brain to do this. So what Mm -hmm. the brain then does is try to find the most efficient way possible to do all of these things to reduce the amount of energy that it takes uh, that it spends, okay? Now, that right. being said, right. when you go to change that habit, what you're doing is you're throwing a wrench into a system the brain has created for efficiency. <laughs> and that's why we tend to feel ourselves not being successful in creating new habits, and it's all of us, you know? And if you can that's begin to it. master that, to realize what is my thinking when I decided I want to start jogging every day so I can maybe lose weight and get fit, 
And then that third morning comes along, and the brain's like, oh, come on, dude, you know you want another 30 minutes of sleep. You know, we were like this before. What was the problem? Everything was fine then, wasn't it? <laughs> See, it's really trying to tell you, look, this is taking me some work. I really don't like it. You know, things were happy the way they were before. Catch yourself doing that and say, get up and do it anyway. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and, and you had started early in the program talking about this. You know, there, there are programs of eating seven to ten days. Mm -hmm. Right, seven to ten days. You create. You start the creation of a new habit. Right. It's that third day. There's something about that third day, even with sugar, exercise, and all that. They're like, eh, I don't think so because I'm now I'm not in my comfort zone, and that's when you just got to push the envelope, push the edge, get support, get someone to to you're accountable to, so that you make it over that hump day, if you will, mm -hmm. and you're on the other side. Now, I understand, Roseanne, that you have a book out there that people should take a look at. Tell us about that as well as your website. Yeah. Oh, thanks. I'd love to tell you. Um, well, I wrote a book called The All-Natural Sugar Detox, and you can get it on Amazon. And I wrote that book specifically because I want to be able to um, educate people on everything that they needed to know, how to recognize all the hidden sugars in the food that we eat, how to recover from addictive patterns caused by the food we ate, and how to, and it was more of a guide to how to restore them to a healthier life. And the book actually became a bestseller, so easy read to, to check out. Um, you can get more information, go to my website, and it's simply my name, RoseanneZapp.com. And if, if the readers are inter or the listeners are interested they can uh join my mailing list there's a, a place there to join the mailing list and i will gift them uh one of my other books i created a book uh on green smoothies how simple it is to make green smoothies i give uh, about uh, 11 of my most favorite simple and yummy recipes out so they'll get that with some other Helpful tips that I I do send out uh, weekly and monthly blogs of recipes and health tips throughout the year. Uh, so I would I would just say this time of the year is a great time to check that out if you're preparing for some changes, lifestyle changes, or if you're looking for a couple great desserts right now between now and New Year's that you need to go to a party. I um, this this in the month of December added a whole bunch of really simple, healthier ideas for desserts and other foods you can take to your holiday parties that you will feel, won't feel as guilty about. <laughs> and nothing better than a blackberry ice cream showing up at the door of a holiday party <laughs> and people realizing, you mean you just use coconut milk? Really? Exactly. Oh, and speaking of blackberry, I have a, a fruit pie on there that literally takes 20 minutes to make it. It is a rock star at every party I go to. This super easy berry pie to make. Yeah. Uh, keep I, your I, blood sugar stable and uh, make you feel keep you feeling guilt free. <laughs> and for the men out there, you certainly want to visit RoseanneZaft.com so you can discover what she looked like when she won that competition. You'll be astounded. <laughs> Roseanne, it's been a real pleasure to have you here on the program today to let people know that when that holiday arrives, they can actually be more empowered than they think they can, and when that New Year's resolution gets put down on the list, that you actually can achieve that. But the biggest thing we need to have is compassion, and as you said, the what were the three steps again? We need to just become aware. Right, aware. Be willing. Be willing. And take action. There you go. I don't think it gets any easier than that, does nope. it? <laughs> nope, and just take the action of joining on my uh, email list, and I will guide you along. I'll hold your hand along the way to help you uh, become the vibrant you that you were born to be. Absolutely. Roseanne Zaft, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 Radio program. On behalf of me and my staff, we wish you and all a very wonderful holiday season. Thanks again. Have a great holiday, too. You, too. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for joining us. You can also discover more at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. Please sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter. 
You can also follow us on Twitter at Beyond 50 Radio, where I've posted some tweets about this particular program here. And you can also follow us on Facebook as well. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.